Welcome back to another episode of the Working Class Fishing Podcast. Uh, John and Brian here. Uh, today, uh, we are doing another video on our uh, Building on a Budget series or podcast, wherever you're listening. If you're watching us on YouTube or you're listening to us in podcast land, um, this Building on a Budget episode is going to be on family fishing. And so, um, we're, we're going to talk about uh, some key points here and kind of kind of just graze over some stuff. But as always, we always want to hear from you, the listener, the viewer. Uh, what what are things that you could add in uh, advice wise on on a lot of that stuff? We're going to talk about things that we've learned, uh, especially as parents uh, with our kids and everything else. Um, a lot of our experiences come from uh needing to set up our, our kids, family members on a budget. And so we want to definitely make sure uh, that we're setting up everybody on a budget and that we're giving you guys good advice on that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, experiences and things like that, but um, kind of looking at our different perspectives here and all that stuff, we, we usually start out with, you know, is, is this something that your family wants to get into? And John, I'm going to let you elaborate on that a little bit, um, just from your experience with your son and uh, other folks in your family versus my family, because it, it's kind of a, um, a, a quite the transition back and forth uh, as far as that goes. So um, if you want to elaborate a little bit on that, um, I think I think it would be good coming from you. So because we've talked a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so fishing and the outdoors is just it's not necessarily for everyone um uh, it goes with anything though you know some people really take to certain things and other people just have a complete disdain for it uh, if there's someone that doesn't enjoy something and they don't don't want to do it you can't force them to go do that it's that that's not right for them it, it, it's it's not fair for anyone to, trying to do anything right there but in regards to fishing, uh, you know, my, my kid, he, uh, he's been fishing a ton. He's caught a lot of really great fish, but I always was like, Hey man, we're going fishing. It was never like, Hey man, let's, do you want to go fishing? It was always, I always had him going. Uh, he, he, at this point right now, he's, he's kind of burnt out on it. He he'll go, he really likes the outdoors and he likes throwing rocks in the water and checking out all the different trees and animals and wildlife but he doesn't want to fish and that's fine uh, i'm not going to force him to go out there with a rod and reel and go fish if he doesn't want to so you can't force your family just because you enjoy it you can't force your family to go out there and do something they don't want to do just just keep that in mind it's um they're not going to want to do it tomorrow if you force them to do it. And they might not want to do it in 10 years if you force them to do it. It's at some point they may just want to go with you because they like spending time with you. And then maybe that's the trip where they're like, wow, this is actually really fun. But just, just keep that in consideration, you know, and, and Brian, what about you, man? What's, you know, with your family? So it, 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 it's a bizarre dynamic because um, we don't force any of the, the kids or family members to, you know, go fish or anything like that. Or, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you're necessarily forcing your son to go fish or, or you know, that, that that's even the implied intent that, that you're, you know, casting it as. It's like, hey, let's go do something. <laughs> you know, that, that's more of what you're what yeah. you're saying is like hey, let's go do something. And that's usually how all of this stuff starts with, with in my family, uh, my girls. I'll say, hey, you want to go do something? Yeah, okay. So we go do something. And they're like, hey, that was kind of fun. Or oh, I don't want to do that again. It, it kind of goes back and forth. Um, in, in my family, what, what's weird is, and, and maybe this is just uh, one of those things where, um, you know, kids, family members, they, they have like ADD, ADHD, <laughs> kind of all over the place. Right. So the kids will be like, yeah, let's go fishing. And so we'll go fishing and they're like, yeah, that was really fun. But now I want to go bounce off the wall and go kayaking or, 
uh, I want to go hang out at the mall or I want to do this. It's like not really consistent, but there's, there's always like, you know, it, usually I can twist their arm once or twice a month to go out fishing. Like, Hey, you want to go fishing? We're going to go down to the beach. Oh, okay, cool. And it's like, you know, fish for four hours and then end up at the saltwater taffy shop. Right. And it's like, Oh, and we got candy and we got clam chowder. And then uh, we saw a dead seagull and you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, ting, 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 ting. It's like a fly in a glass box. But, but I've always, I've never like relegated the kids to like, you're going to come out here and you're going to fish for 12 hours with me for steelhead or it never happened like that, yeah. you know, but, but the funny part is, is when the kids start catching fish, they get all excited. They're like, Oh my God, I got a fish. And, and until then they're like, this sucks. And then all of a sudden they catch a fish. <laughs> um, you know, as far as my wife goes, my wife loves fishing. She's like, absolutely into it. Like I, I never get a complaint about, um, oh, uh, you know, well, Hey, I, I picked up this four pack of spoons at the store. Oh, cool. Well, those, those should work good. Or like, Hey, I picked up a new rod combo. You know, it, I never get a complaint about that. Cause usually, uh, I'll, I'll pick stuff up and she's got like her own fishing kit. Right. So she's got her own ultralight rod and reel and her pack and everything else. And it goes in her car. She's like, well, I'm going to go catch a damn fish. You know, uh, she's like, I want to go get bass. <laughs> I'm like, all right, fine, go get a bass. You know, it's like some, some people will call up and be like, I want to go to the mall and, or I want this, or I want that. And it's like, okay, whatever. She's like, I'm going to take my kayak and my sister, and we're going to take a bottle of fireball and we're going to go paddle up river and we're going to drink some fireball and uh, do this whole soccer mom thing while I try to fish for bass. And she catches fish, you know, and, and it's like, Oh, Hey, cool. She's like, there's a guy down at the boat ramp. He had a huge bass, you know? So she'll like send me pictures of fish and everything else. Now she'll come out with me on the drift boat. And then, and then we start bickering back and forth. I'm like, no, cast out over there and, and leave it out. She's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. You know? And it's, it's just like, oh God, shoot. Me. You know, uh, there, there's those times, but then there's the other times where, you know, like we'll go out and she's like, you know, really like intense. She's like, I don't want to screw up. I don't want to do anything wrong. And, and, uh, but, but then we start catching fish and it's like, Hey, you know, so I guess it all depends, but th that's also because we're older. And so like, we enjoy those, those slower things now, <laughs> you know, not so high intensity. It's like, Hey, let's go down to Disneyland on a roller coaster, you know? So the, the, that whole family dynamic of fishing for me is really bizarre because sometimes the kids are all like, yeah, let's go. Like my daughter, if, if we could live on the John day and she could fish for smallmouth bass every single day on the John day, that's all she'd want to do. It's like, she's like, we got to go back over to the John Day. All these rivers <laughs> suck in Western Oregon. I'm like, well, you just got to learn how to fish them. She's like, yeah, they suck. You know, well, there's not a lot of places where you're just going to bomb out a, a worm at random and catch fish, big and small, you know, so, and, and then the accessibility and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, there's a few bank places where everybody can access, but you better be ready to go hike in the desert if you want to get to the good fish. And, and so she'll, she'll give me about a mile and a half, two miles, and then it's done. I'm, I'm fortunate to have the kids I have. Like I can take, I can take my oldest daughter out, you know, steelhead fishing and she'll just sit there and cast and float, cast and float. And then, and after about an hour, she's like, I'm hungry and I don't feel like being out here. It's too cold. Oh, okay, fine. You know, and then it will change something <laughs> up. It's like, here, here's a spinner. So it, it's real hit and miss with families. I, and I think the biggest thing is, is just having, having the time and the effort and all that stuff and just letting the kids do their thing. You know, they don't have to sit there intently with their fishing pole in their hand, staring at the water. We, we fished and, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we're going to go and swim while our rods are in the water. And my daughter caught brook trout doing that. It's stupid. <laughs> He's like, I'm not catching anything. She yanks your rod and she reels it up. And here's like a 10 inch brook trout on the end. I'm like, I mean, you're not catching anything. She's like, <laughs> oh my God, I caught a fish. And it's like, yeah, yeah, no kidding. You know, and she's just like flailing around, like singing, you know, disney songs she's like six or seven i don't know she's like in her bathing suit and i was like you know whatever she don't care and all this other stuff and yeah it catches a fish i was like okay i guess it works you know the whole adage of oh you're gonna scare the fish off you know it didn't apply to her that day so yeah there's it, it, you you got to make it fun and interesting or make it like a part of something bigger i think you know that's that's my that's my view on that one so yeah, you know, I, I think I think the little dude, he he will eventually come around, I think, just to the 
from where we live you know there's not ton try very hard <laughs> to go catch some fish it's always just like hey i'm gonna cast out here i'm gonna turn over here and i'm gonna tell my uncle that his uncle that dad calls me the catfish king because i catch a catfish everywhere i go and then sure sure shit he catches a catfish <laughs> like five seconds later he he's just his his personal best large mouth is like three point something pounds <laughs> and it's it's huge it, it would have been like a five or six pounder but it was skinny the head on it was giant it was an absolute brute of a fish and if it had better conditions it would have been like six five or six pounds easy good lord so he just and he caught it on a rooster tail a little inline spinner he was throwing it out there and he was he was not having it he was like it's hot i want to go home can we get snacks And then keeps reeling. Sorry about that. My Zoom just closed completely <laughs> we've been having tons of trouble today it's been unbelievable but uh yeah he wanted snacks and i bombed this inline spinner out there as far as i could i handed him his rod and i said man just reel this in and we'll go home we'll go get snacks go to the gas station and uh he's reeling it in and he's reeling it in quick because he's ready to go and it got slammed <laughs> it got and uh, he fishes a Zebco Dock Demon most of the time. And it, I don't know if you've ever fished one of those rods, it's the length of an ice fishing pole. Yep. And it's just, it's like a wet noodle, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no back to it. And uh, he landed that fish on it. He was reeling straight through the drag and everything. I was like, you got it. <laughs> when I realized it was a big fish, I was like, dude, you've, you've got to let it take some line or it's going to break you off. And he's just like, bzz, 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 just reeling straight through the drag all the way in. And he landed it. I don't know how people do that, man. Yeah. They, they do it all the time. And it, it's, it's like always your family. It seems like. Well, it's one of those things uh, guides do out West here, especially with salmon and steelhead. They'll set the drag. You don't touch the drag when you get into a guide's boat. Like uh, I'll, I'll say like Riley, he, he's like, yeah, go ahead and, change it a couple quicks you know yeah that's it but normally uh, they they all have the drag set like they know exactly where the drag needs to be set because people will hook fish and they'll just start cranking and they'll, they'll break a fish off so it's a good thing you had the drag set for them and i always set the drag <laughs> for the kids i'm like don't touch anything just cast it out if fish hits it you know it might pull a little bit of line but once it stops once it stops going zzz, the, i always use uh, that audible yeah. then start reeling and i was like don't let up on it and and so you know it, it's but it's that's awesome now because he because he went out and he whacks this huge fish most kids or most people that uh, like want to fish would be so ecstatic they or or never fish you're like oh my god i got this huge fish but i noticed that more with kids today is like you know my my nephew got a 17 and a half inch trout this last weekend we're just trolling spoons blows this thing up and he's putting on a display for everybody on the bank they're like what in the hell they're not catching anything and and he's got this ultra light just like the dock demon you know yeah. it, it's probably the same action it's like a little shimano fx ultra light like a five and a half foot rod and and he's got that thing doubled over uh standing on the boat and he we reel that thing up i'm like that's a big fish dude and i was like <laughs> let it take drag and it's, and it's diving and everything and he gets it up and it was like all these people are stopped. They're like, what the hell are you using? And it's like a spoon, you know? 
But anyways, <laughs> you know, he's, he's over there. He gets it up there and all these other people are like, Oh God, I want to catch a fish that big. And they're like throwing everything. It's like just 4th of July erupting. Uh, and he's just like, Oh, it's another fish. You know, I'm like, that's a trophy size rainbow <laughs> trout, you know? And, and he, he was all like, just like, Oh, it's another fish. You know, it's another fish. That's, but that's, I don't know. Sometimes I think kids don't show that excitement. I know when I was that age, I would have been like freaking out. Oh yeah. I would have been flipping out. So I think, I think that, 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 um, love of fishing comes early. I think that's kind of what it is. And, and that thrill of the tug and all that, I think you got to have like a certain addictive personality to the, that, that physical combat of the fish. And I, that, I think that that's what it, it, and it starts early because there's some kids, man, you, you'll see them and all they want to do is fish. They're, they're just like, I'm, I'm a fishing fool, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, there's other kids who are like, well, you know, this sucks, you know, it, but I think that's also, a, a you know, a cultural thing. So I don't know. I don't know. But it's kind of funny though that you know he's like, oh, what do you go to the gas station and get some JoJo's and <laughs> go back now? He's out there whacking four pound bass. Most people are drooling over it, you know. Yeah. They're like, oh god, I, I got to get a four pound bass. Oh, that's See, funny. When he uh, after he caught it though, he was glowing. Oh, that's awesome. He was he was grinning ear to ear. We've got a. I've actually got the picture framed. It's it's on the it's in the curio cabinet over here. It's. It was just, it was a great photo. It just really captured the moment for him because it was dark, dude. It was about to get dark and it was just, it was awesome, dude. Oh, that's so, incredible. <laughs> that's so, super so, cool. So he's got, you know, he's got all these memories that we've made together fishing that I think he appreciates. I just don't think he wants, it, it's not as, it's not engaging enough for him. You know, the, the bobber or the float fishing, he, right when he gets a strike, I swear, it's like clockwork. He, he's looking at the birds mm -hmm. or he's kicking rocks. He's looking down and kicking rocks. I'm like, hey, man, you're getting a bite. And then he yanks his rod, but it's too late, you know. <laughs> but what I found with him, what he actually likes more is fishing like micro crankbaits and inline spinners, something he can throw and cast and retrieve. Mm -hmm. that, that was something he enjoyed because it was more – involved he was more involved with what he was doing yeah so yeah i think and and to that point i think family members anybody really getting started out yeah i think i think the cast and retrieve fishing the the plastics you know like the curly tails and the and the grubs and things like that they're 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 cheap and they're a retrieval type bait you know it's not just to cast out and sit it, it, it you know rooster tails or spoons or you know spoons take more skill than a spinner a spinner yeah. you cast out and you retrieve and and usually if there's fish in the area they're going to hit it you know as long as you got the right size right you know whatever whatever's tickling the fish's fancy that day you're going to catch fish and it's a very active way to fish and I, i've always been a big proponent of trying to get the kids on a spinner as soon as you can now that's not in every case or even beginner fishermen like I, and i fished with some people that i thought were pretty experienced but they cannot operate a spinner correctly in certain um areas you know a, a lake is pretty benign and you're you're usually not going to hang up in the lake and snag and lose your gear a river is a different story because <laughs> you yeah. have currents and i mean a river is totally different but a, but a lake is is a pretty benign place to to really um uh, get kids started out with like rooster tails or spoons or blue fox spinners or uh, any any one of those commercially made spinners that they they work great or micro crankbaits I, I i'm tempted to go down to the store after we're done recording this and go buy a bunch of micro crankbaits just to try them so i don't know if you'll have them but so there there's two other things so they um beetle spins for one beetle spins are deadly they're mm -hmm. absolutely deadly it's like a trout magnet uh, they just catch fish everywhere for some reason. Like Sam from Instagram, Country Boy Creek Fishing is yeah. the biggest beetle spin advocate I've ever met in my life. If you <laughs> if you if you can have a conversation with him and he doesn't bring up a beetle spin, he's probably having a bad day. Yeah. And uh, but you you can buy these little spinners that go on jigs, right? And. <laughs> my buddy had something he's like hey, he, he's a real real kind of i wish i wish i could mimic his 
his vernacular and his accent and everything. But he's like, you ain't never fished a jitterbug? That was one of the one of the things he told me one time. And I was like, no, dude, I've never fished a jitterbug. And he's but the one that got me was, you ain't never fished a Joe fly. And what did you know? Knowing now, it's it was literally a Griffiths gnat, like a size fourteen Griffiths gnat, tied on a one of those spinners. Oh, <laughs> and it catches a ridiculous amount of fish. So just. Yeah, just it, it was on a nymph hook. It was like a Griffiths net on a on a nymph hook. It was black with red thread. And it was tied to one of those little spinners that you can just you put the the hook eye through and you tie onto the circle for your spinner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catch his fish. You should try it sometime. You know, I was running, I was running something similar, like uh micro spinner bait. Yeah. And, and I put a little um green um curly tail on there you know or not a curly tail but uh, i call them mr twisters you know yeah little little chartreuse uh like a one inch mr twister dinky little thing and i and i had some gills chasing it you know they were they were like oh yeah i'm gonna go after that but it, it, they seemed to be confused whether or not they wanted to hit the spinner blade or they wanted to hit the jig so it's kind of like eh, i'm gonna take this off and just you know put one piece of number seven split shot with the little jig head and toss it out there and they're just blowing it up but that that you know Playing around with some of that stuff uh, gives you an idea of what's going to be user friendly for a kid versus not user friendly for a kid. You know, which ones take, you know, like jerk baits. Jerk baits aren't probably going to be um, user friendly for a kid. A whopper plopper. <laughs> jerk probably... baits ain't user friendly for adults. <laughs> no, no, no. They're, it takes some skill to get a jerk bait down. Now, a whopper plopper, on the other hand, Probably yeah. pretty safe having a kid throw that out as long as they a, stay out of the logs and the sticks that are that are submerged like a half inch underwater. That way the trebles don't lock up on it. And you know that you know the fish are surface striking. Uh, the, you got those two factors. A whopper plopper, I think, is like one of those universal baits. It's it's better than a popper from the skill operator standpoint. It's just like uh, the Lake X lures uh, for the muskie. Uh, you could take a kid out and and give them um, a Dr. Evil as long as they can pitch that giant ass bait, you know, and, and they are huge. They're like the size of a Endura 30 pound thrust Minn Kota prop. Yeah, they're, but they're if they, giant. Yeah, if you toss that out there, it hits the surface of the water and goes clunk, 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 clunk. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot better than a bucktail or or something like a um like a plastic frog and and for those of you that are musky fishermen out there you know what size frog i'm talking like full size bullfrog you know eight inches long big old green thing you know what type of skill that takes to work that frog well a dr evil isn't going to take that much skill and we all know that you know yeah, it's going to be 10, 20,000 casts, but the, the time that that kid hits 19,999 and that, you know, Leviathan erupts out of the water and blows it up. If you can get kids to be patient enough to, to go after a muskie, maybe trolling for them are, are a different story, but um, those types of lures are simple. That, I guess the comparison here is the simple operation. Rooster tail, simple. Blue fox spinner, simple. Um, you know, a mepsagila, simple. Those are all simple lures that, that you can put in the hands of a beginner, a kid or adult that's never fished before, and it keeps them active. Like you said, that activity, I think that works out good. So if, you know, if I had to recommend like a really cheap setup that absolutely catches a lot of fish and catches a large variety of fish, you know, Willie, Willie Gray, right? He's, he's a he's the trout magnet equivalent of sam mm -hmm. he but you can fish those little jigs under bobbers mm -hmm. and then the you know your your kiddos they don't have to worry about putting hooks on worms or worms on hooks rather or minnows or live bait or anything like that and you'll you'll catch fish on it and it, it's very visual for it and it also it gives him some semblance of learning how to work baits because yeah, you can leave it out and let it sit and you'll probably catch fish or you can start teaching them that, Hey, there's different patterns that you can figure out what the fish is eating that style of movement that day. Mm -hmm. You can start teaching them about water depth and 
you know, it's, it's, a, I, I think that's a really great way to start teaching um, someone new to fishing or your kids. That's a great way to do it because you can get a ton of trout magnets for incredibly cheap in comparison to a lot of other plastics and they literally catch everything, literally catch everything. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we, we're, we're going into like the gear and everything else here. Right. And, and we we've talked about like, what are the ideal combos? What are the ideal things to, you know, get, get the family set up with if, if you're, if, even if you're new to fishing, um, I just got a, uh, you know, a string of texts from my, um, former neighbor, he sold his house, moved to Wyoming. And, and so he's like, I'm going to go get into some fishing over there. I'm like, well, let me know. Cause you're in the locale of some really good rivers. Anyways, he, um, he said, uh, he sent me a message. Hey, I'm going to go fishing with a guy tomorrow. Uh, what, what should I get? And for him, it, it's not like he's financially strapped or anything, but I said, well, why don't you go get the black max combo from Abby Garcia? I was like, we've recommended it before on the podcast. It is a great combo. If you have a, like a sportsman's warehouse or a Cabela's or something like that there, uh, where you live, uh, they should have that combo uh, for a kid. I, I it might be a little bit pricey, but I think that you're going to get far better quality out of that. So most of your combos that I'm seeing now, and, and maybe you don't see these, John, uh, the ones that start to get the, a better reel and a better rod usually start around 40 bucks. And that's, that's what I'm seeing, you know, 35 to $40. You got to still strip that mono off there because it's just junk. The stuff it comes from the factory is just garbage so you you, you put respool it with a penny a yard trialing you know if, if that's the case but i think that that black max combo let's say your kid's been out fishing a couple times with a friend and they're just like i want to go fishing you can get that combo and that combo is going to last them until they're an adult as long as they don't you know dredge it in sand and you know leave it outside or you know run over it with their bike in the garage or it, it, it'll last a long time and i think that that's a worthy you know, good, um, all purpose beginner rod combo. You get the, you get the spinning setup, not the bait caster, but the spinning setup. And I think that that's like, you, you could, you could outfit your family with that. The ones uh, I would go, go ahead, John. Uh, so I was just going to say, um, uh, we're talking about the, the GX2, I believe mm -hmm. here, the G, yeah. the ugly stick GX2. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just wanted to, you're absolutely right with everything that you said, by the way, it's, it is a fantastic combo. It's for, it's like 45 bucks, sportsman warehouse Academy, uh, your Walmart, your shields, mm -hmm. things like that. You can get it all on those places. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I was just thinking about that. I was like, I think, I think we're talking about the GX too, but it's not just like Brian said, this, this spinning spinning is very mm -hmm. crucial for beginners and uh just for people for ease ease of use in yeah. a lot of aspects and it's spinning spinning setups are a lot of people refer to them as fairy wands right um at least here in the south they're like oh i don't fish none of them fairy wands okay well then you don't finesse fish a lot you probably don't catch a lot of really big bass in the summer because you're dumb mm -hmm. um uh don't uh, back to that whole stigma just bad mindset don't let people talk down to you for spinning gear and the ugly stick gx2 is the way to go and like brian said just get you some new line man yeah get you some new line for that yeah the, the, yeah the shakespeare the uh, I, I don't know why i was stuck on that abu uh and and i think it's because i want to go get one anyway <laughs> 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 i think i think it, I, i'm like yeah, I think I, I want to go pick one of those up here in the next couple of months, just because, you know, why not, you know, but, but also to really put it to work and, and get you guys some um, more feedback on that too, you know, to, to give you some live feedback and be like, Hey, this is the nuances, everything else, you know, we can, I think John and I can speak to um, a lot of Shimano equipment and the nuances of that, like the KS reel or the, um, uh, you know, like I have a Cardiff 301. Uh, that's one of my other reels or, or the SLX or whatever. We can, we can speak to those bait casters quite a bit. Um, but uh, that, that combo will, will get you by um, and, and really get you rolling. And, and, and that, 
but spinning gear is important. And here's why. And, and, and John's talked about this before. The, the push button reels, everybody always will push you towards the push button reels. Number one, yeah, they have the novelty push button reels. You can get a Barbie rod, you can get a Spider-Man rod or a Scooby-Doo or a Mickey Mouse or um, the GI Joe, whatever, whatever you want, you know, uh, I, and they even make adult push button spinning or, or, or um, push button combos with that, with that push button bait caster and all that. It, it's okay if you have good line and you don't have any issues, but more times than not, people go buy them from the store. They rip them out of the package right there on the bank. They tie on a hook and some weight. And the first time they cast it out, it backlashes. And in order to unbacklash that, you got to cut all the line, all of it. And you got to pull the top off. And then you got to have a screwdriver with you to pull the top of the bale off, to pull that out. Uh, it's, it's just a massive mess. Uh, unlike with a spin combo, everything's out there and open. You can see it. You can fix it. Usually you just back the line out. Um, you don't have to cut all that line off and, and you can typically get that cleaned up pretty quick. And, and it's better for the kids to learn how to throw a, a spinning combo than it is a push button combo because a spinning combo, number one, uh, you're going to get more universal reels uh, down the road. If the kids are really into fishing, uh, you can get a variety of gear ratios and speeds and, and spin rods are so versatile. You know, that, that's the whole thing. A bait caster can be versatile too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but a spin rod is so versatile, uh, for bass, you know, you can toss out spinner baits, you can toss out soft plastics, you can toss out cranks, you can toss out, you know, finesse and jigs and, all, you know, jerk baits even. Um, does it look as cool while you're standing there on the bank? Is somebody with a bait caster? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't make a difference to me. Am I fishing? Yeah, then I look cool. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I look at it, you know, uh, but, but that, that, whole notion of uh you know needing to go out and get a bait caster you you got to crawl before you walk and you got to walk before you run and i would i would skip over the push button and go straight to the spinning reel because you, you're just going to be so much more benefited by going to the spinning reel over the bait caster it's just not even not even a debatable subject in my mind it, like, people will get push buttons don't get me wrong but it, it's not it's not a good way to go not not for a beginner no I, and i'm uh, i'm a huge advocate of literally everything you just said i just want to chime in on this last little piece on spending years the way to go if you're getting started this last little piece might be your tipping point to really say yeah i'm gonna start with spinning gear it's literally so much cheaper cost wise than a bait caster you can get, I'm not even kidding, it's the same rod, the same exact rod. Um, let's just say it's the Shimano. Well, Shimano SLX rod doesn't count because they sell the baitcaster and the regular rod at the same price. But let's say um, literally just about any other company out there, the, the rods are not the same price. It's the same rod. It's made from the same blank. It's mm -hmm. just one has bigger eyes. And one's got bait casting eyes yep. and one will be like 40 bucks. And one will, I'm not even kidding, be like 80 bucks. There's uh, the bait casting gear and rods are so much more expensive. And if, if you don't get to fish a lot and maybe you don't want to dump that much money into it, really, really go with that spinning gear. It's, it's less expensive. And I, when I say cheap, I don't mean cheap quality. I mean, just cost wise. And um, it, it's really visual in a lot of aspects. And I can skip so much easier with spinning gear than I can with a bait caster. Uh, I think because I really commit to the cast because I know if I blow up that spool, well, it's going to take me a couple minutes, but I'll get it cleaned up and I'll be reeling again pretty quick but if i blow up a spool on my bait caster <laughs> i'm there's a good chance i'm about to cut 20 dollars of line off my spool mm -hmm. and i won't i won't be able to fix it because i've knotted it all the way down so it, it spinning gear helps you learn a lot of great techniques that you can transfer over to bait casting because they cast the same the exact same 
except, you know, one, you're using your thumb to control your spool tension and things like that. But the actual motion of the rod in the air is the exact same. If you can overhand cast with spinning gear, you can overhand cast with a bait caster. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's the same exact thing. But cost-wise, so much cheaper. So much cheaper. Yeah. And, and that's the, I think that's the big turn on the spinning gear is that, yes, it is way cheaper. <laughs> and and yeah. you can get good combos of spinning gear now. I, I know that um, around here... So, so in your neck of the woods, you probably have bass spinning combos and bass and pan fish and, and, the, and those types of things or yeah. catfish combos around here. We have salmon and steelhead combos, and then we have sturgeon combos. And then we also have surf combos, you know, it, it's all regionally specific, but that's the whole thing. It's like you, you get your, you know, beginner fisher going and you give them a spin rod and then they're like, Hey, this is a lot of fun. I want to go fish for sturgeon or big species, alligator gar, or long nose gar, or whatever. And you're like, okay, we need to go get you a heavier rod. Well, you just get a bigger version of the same thing. They already know the mechanics of the casting. So they've learned the mechanics of the casting on that rod. They don't have to go relearn it. It's not like where, you know, when I was growing up, everything was a, a saltwater big pen 301 bait caster. And, and that's what we used for salmon, steelhead, and sturgeon. And, and these were big 130-pound drag reels, and they had big braid and all this other stuff. And you had to learn how to cast with that thing. I'm not kidding. you know. Or you got an old Abu, uh, or uh, what was it, a uh, uh, Mitchell Garcia, uh, you know, one of those types of things. These are, these are old reels. Like, they're, they're ancient when I was a kid. And, and people were still using them. They're all metal geared. But you had to learn how to cast with that. But then when Abu Garcia came out with the Cardinal series back in the 80s, this old, old spin, it, they, they put like a 75 pound drag on this thing. And you could go out and you could whip on salmon and steelhead plunking, or, you know, you could even boat troll with the spin rod, which is totally unconventional. But it was, it was a heavy, you know, eight foot rod and it was a great boat trolling rod. You put six ounces of weight on it and, and, and run a herring mooching rig. And, and catch salmon with it. And it was a boat spinning rod. It didn't have a bait caster. Now we've kind of went back to line counters and things like that, but th that's the whole thing is you can get little tiny spin rods like for ice fishing and, and you can get big spin rods. And the thing is, is all the mechanics are the same all the way across. It's just your bait gets bigger, your weight gets bigger. And then, you know, your tackle changes, but it's so universal and it's way cheaper too. It just is like John said, way cheaper. It it is, man. And the thing is, too, you're not going to find, you will never, let me go ahead and just throw this out there. You will never find a bait casting rod in mass above, I would dare to say, eight feet. Mm -hmm. You will not go to a regular store and find many bait casting rods. And when I say never, that's, that's, it's really not never, but that that's a super long bait casting rod but you can go spend 25 dollars and you'll get a broomstick like shakespeare rod we call them broomsticks because they're literally as stout as a broomstick and you can get them all the way up in like 10 feet mm -hmm. and they're like 25 bucks and they're rated for like six or eight ounces of lure lure weight and you throw like a 3500 4k even like 5k reel and then we're talking about like the series the smaller, like 500s are like your ultralights. And then as you move up in the 500 increments or thousands, your, your spools get bigger, the reels get bigger, the drag gets greater. So, you know, you throw a big reel on that. And guess what? A 5,000 series spinning reel at Walmart, it's like 20 bucks. So you're no, no kidding. You're looking at something that you can go fish the salt with for 35, 40 bucks. Mm-hmm and reliably bring that fish in i'm not not even kidding that's yeah. that's that's just how spinning gear works yeah i mean uh, it, it is a regional thing because um you go down to our sporting goods store you can find 10 and a half foot bait casters here but that's regional because we yeah. use them for bobber dogging and float fishing and all that stuff you're not going to find that in texas 
or Louisiana or anything else. You guys don't have any kind of fish species down there where a 10 and a half foot bait caster would even be conducive. Yeah. But, but it, and, and even for salt fishing, it's just kind of silly because uh, to get a sealed bearing bait casting reel, oh, <laughs> you think you think 100 bucks is expensive? You think 200 is expensive? Try four or 500 because that's what you're looking at. And we do have them. We have them here because we fish the ocean. Uh, you're going to probably see a lot of them like uh, down Mobile and uh, New Orleans, you know, anywhere where you're going to have salt. That's where you go into the store. It's like, wow, that's a pretty cool, cool little gold reel. Oh, it's eight hundred dollars. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Never mind. Uh, what's that for? Oh, that's that's for big game fishing out in uh, the Caribbean or the Gulf or whatever. You know, that's 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 what you're looking at. Um, and and it's built for salt water. So and and you can go do the same fishing, everything else for way less with a sealed bearing. You know, real. You don't even have to have a sealed sealed drag system or sealed bearings or anything like that. You just gotta wash it good. But nonetheless, uh, that's that's like you know, start out with the cheap spin rod. You know, and and don't invest too much in it. You can always resell it if nobody in the family wants to fish. But I mean, I, you know, that GX2, great rod, I, and I think it works out really good. I've got one. I've literally got one or two in my garage right now. Um, I use them for catfishing out here most of the time. Uh, we got my father-in-law one like two years ago, and he catches everything on it. <laughs> bluegill bass doesn't matter yeah. and remember that if you can only have one rod weight if the rod even has a weight on it depending on what you're buying if you can only have one rod weight get your medium heavy mm -hmm. because that's your all around so ugly stick gx2 i'm pretty sure you can get them from medium all the way up into heavy just go ahead and get yourself that seven foot like that six eight to like seven two seven four medium heavy and you're golden. Yeah, you'll catch everything. Every, anything and everything. So that's a great rod for an adult. It's big. It's it's long. It gives you a lot of cast accuracy. It's got a lot of backbone to it. But if you're looking to get your family into it, uh, maybe you've got little ones. Or maybe you've got a, a spouse like mine that's like four foot nothing. And that rod is really it starts to get unmanageable for them because it's just, it's long. It's really, really long. It's not like a fly rod, a 10 foot fly rod in a eight year old's hand is it's a little scary, but at the same time, it's, it's not, it's not a big deal, but for with conventional gear, especially the, the smaller you are, the harder it gets for you to cast these long rods because it, it's not like fly fishing at all in a lot of those aspects so my son uh he's about four feet right a little he's actually taller than that he's like four eight some something like that he's, he's a really big kid uh he fishes dock demons and i think those are arguably a little too short for him uh, i'm not saying like oh dang i've got to go get my kids height and then go to walmart and be like well john said get this get this rod no i'm just saying for him, that, that's a little small, but he still casts it fine. Um, Doc Demons, uh, I am the hugest advocate of Doc Demons for children. Mm -hmm. um, they, they land fish well. I've personally seen an absolute brute of a fish, of a bass, get caught on a Doc Demon and uh, didn't break it. The, they make great truck rods. We said that in an episode a while back because they're so small. They're one piece. They come with a reel. Uh, the line on it, I replace. I always replace the line on any any commercial off the shelf reel that I get with line. I always replace the line. Um, I actually use some like Crappie Master High Vis Yellow Line on all of my son's rods, so I can see it better for me. And uh, I don't think he really cares. He just thinks it's cool that he's got this bright yellow line. But um, that, that is uh, just a fantastic rod for children. And the thing is, yeah, you can get that push button Barbie rod. That's just sweet. Don't, don't, don't get it. Don't get me wrong. Those things are sweet. But for the same exact price, if not cheaper, you can get something that's literally going to last um, probably, 
I, I'm, I can't put a number on it, but that Barbie rod's not going to last probably more than a month if it's actually getting fished regularly. And I'm not, not even kidding. Yeah, they look cool. They're a lot of fun to fish with for a little bit, but it, the quality is just not there. You're buying Barbie. You're not buying the rod and reel. Uh, spend less money, save yourself more money in the long run and get, uh, get yourself a Doc Demon. And there's Doc Demon Deluxes. And then there's a Zebco Splash. The Zebco Splash is like a five and a half foot rod. Now, that's what he fishes majority of the time uh, until uh, he actually lost the drag knob off the top of his spool. So it, that rod's sitting in there waiting for a, a new ultralight reel. But that, that's a really good length for a lot of people, that, that five and a half, six, six and a half foot range. That's not unmanageable for a lot of people. My mama, the sweetest lady on earth, by the way, mama, if you're listening, um, she's like, she, she's a real small lady, right? But that's the rod side that she uses, and she casts just fine with it. So uh, just keep that in mind. These really big rods that are arguably more affordable might not be suited for smaller folks so just keep that in mind but dog demon outstanding the splash the reel on the splash is made out of plastic okay it is really low quality reel it looks really awesome the rod so the splash is like 25 bucks the dog demon is like 15 okay uh if if you can replace the reel on the splash there's like a, a shimano 500 reel that's also around the 20 dollar range if you just really wanted to get something for your kiddo that's like about five foot that's a really good rod and uh the little like 500 series reels from like mitchell abby garcia i have a shimano ultralight one that i picked up not long ago because it's on clearance because no one was buying it yeah. I, I got i got it for like 12 bucks it was normally like 20 um, just get you like a 500 or a thousand reel and you can even oversize your reel on those smaller rods. It's just, it's heavier. It, but, um, if I had to pick one size reel to kind of suit it all, it would be probably be a 2000. It'd be yeah. a 2000. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the 2000 series reel is like universal across the board. It gives you enough line. It's easy to handle. It usually balances out pretty well on a five and a half foot, six and a half foot rod combo. And, and you can run fairly light line on it. You can get a lot of light line on it actually. So you can, you could, let's say, you know, you're like me, you, you like braid and I put braid on everything. Cause when the kids hang up, they can usually, um, you know, pull the lure out uh, uh, pretty easy. You know, my buddy calls it winch cable. Uh, uh, because it's so <laughs> strong, you know? And, um, anyways, so, uh, I put 20 pound power pro on, on all of my, uh, smaller ultralight reels. Some people are like, damn, that's overkill. But at the same time, uh, if the kids hang up and they get like in a little tree limb, I can get a hold of that rod and I can rip that tree limb loose or break the, the lure free and not lose a bunch of line. Uh, it seems to work out good, but a 2000 series reel is a really controllable reel for most kids. And once you start jumping up to 2,500, 3000, 3,500, uh, you're, you're talking about bigger reels, heavier drags, more power, um, for larger fish, uh, and, and that they're not necessarily going to need all of that for, um, and a 2000 series reel, uh, whether that be a Shimano or a, um, a pen or anything like that, they're going to, they're, they're going to be a, a fantastic reel. Uh, that that's going to be multi-purpose and it's going to have more than enough power to haul in anything a kid's going to hook into or yourself or somebody else. I think that, you know, and, and the, the Zebco, yeah, I've, I've seen 18 inch trout hauled in on a Zebco dock demon uh, and they, and they were fighting hard. Uh, it, it's kind of like a, a, a bad accident. My buddy is out there throwing a Panther Martin spinner it hooks one. And he's like, Oh, I got a huge fish. And I just see this thing doubled over. And, and this, you know, big silver flash rolling around underwater. I'm like, oh, you got a big fish, dude. And, and but it hogged it in. It didn't break Didn't give up the, the stock reel on it. No problems. Works great. They, they will haul in big fish. They are great. Sorry, got a little sidetracked there. So I, I just, I want to, I want to express this again real quick. You know, 
uh, we, we won't talk about this for a long time. Probably it's, this is, this is more of a thought we both shared on this is there's not a damn thing wrong with Bob or fishing. There's not uh, fly fishing world. So many people use bobbers. It's ridiculous. And it's crazy because they, yeah. Strike indicators. Yeah. Strike. Indi- yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, mm-hmm. you, you, you have your vernacular wrong there, John, because it's supposed to be a strike indicator. You know, it can't be a bar. It's a damn bar. That's all it is. It's a bobber. Yeah. It, it, you know? it's, it's just a bobber, man. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you know, blue ribbon gangsters that are like, Oh, I'm using an indicator with an nymph. You know, you're using a bobber with a weighted fly. Yeah. Done. Okay. It's basically a jig and bobber set up. On yeah, fly it, rod. That, yeah. That's exactly what it is. So if, you know, if, if they can do it and I can do it, you can do it too. Mm-hmm. And the kids. And the kids. Bobber yeah. fishing is great. You can put a lot of stuff under a bobber. We talk about trap trout magnets. You can put crappie mm-hmm. jigs under bobbers. I literally, uh, my dad talks about it all the time. He's like, yeah, we were putting crappie jigs under bobbers. And he was like, they don't make this color anymore. And I can't make this color. So if you can make it, uh, get rich. It is a black and chartreuse tiger striped grub oh, that would be cool man i have tried so many times to make it but it literally it literally takes me i'm not even kidding 40 minutes to make 20 of them no oh, yeah so yeah i could sell you a bag for like 30 bucks <laughs> and i'd i'd make my time back but anyway yeah I've, I've made one one bag of them but he's like yeah i remember we went under there, we had these jigs, we had that exact color, and we had them under bobbers, and we caught crappie non-stop. It was, or no, it wasn't crappie, it was white bass. Yeah. It was white bass. They were catching white bass like it was nobody's business. You know, the, the bobber fishing thing, all right? So here's another thing. So we, we couple up spinning gear and bobbers. You can fish any species you want under a bobber. Effectively, you can fish bass, you can fish crappie, you can fish bluegill, you can fish catfish, even though people say, oh, you can't get a catfish under a bobber. I'll call bullshit on that because I've seen it happen. (laughs) I've done it, right? You can catch salmon under a bobber, done that. Steelhead under a bobber, done that. Trout under a bobber, done that. Never a sturgeon, but we're we're not really talking about targeting those. Gar. One of the, one of John's favorite species, one of the preferred ways to fish for those is under a bobber. So you teach your kids or the, the, the newbie how to fish under a float, reading that water depth, they can fish for anything they want to. I mean, I, barring a few different species, I, I'm sure that you can catch walleye under a bobber and pike under a bobber and, and uh, you know, all these different uh, bobber fishing is so universal. So you teach somebody to throw a spin caster and fish under a bobber. They're, they're covered. You, you've effectively taught them how to catch a lot of fish. You, you float your bait off the bottom. That's what a bobber is doing. And it uh, improves hookups. Done. So, and, and absolutely, no, it really does. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of bobbers and we, we didn't really get super in depth with that in our last building in a budget episode. And we're still not going to get super in depth with that in this episode. <laughs> But there's a lot of really cool ways to put indicators and bobbers on your line. All right, gents. It's they make a lot of different kinds. Figure out what you like. I like the pencil cork bobbers Mm -hmm. with the bright blue, pink, orange, whatever on top. They look cool. It's like got this really traditional aesthetic to it. And I know that sounds funny. But most tackle is geared to sell towards the fishermen, right? Because mm-hmm. the fish don't care. Yep. The fish just want to eat. But the fishermen like, you know, we like fancy, fancy stuff, right? Because why not? Yeah, we might not have the coolest cars, but I, I bet you my spinning gear looks outstanding. It, it matches. My socks don't, but my spinning <laughs> gear does, right? <laughs> so just figure out what kind of bobbers you like the foam ones are great okay uh the pencil ones they are so responsive incredibly responsive but those foam ones can hold a lot more weight 
right. Mm -hmm. Those, those, those pencil ones are more for like, uh, your size 10 hooks with your crickets and stuff on them for bluegill fishing, uh, foam ones, a lot more applications. They're really visible. Um, so, you know, just, just keep that in mind. There are different sizes for different things. Um, just kind of mess around with it. And if you have any questions, email us, hit us up on Instagram, you know, shoot us a line somewhere and we'll try to help you figure out what you're looking for before you go buy something you don't need. Yeah. And that might be a future, um, uh, extra episode on YouTube, uh, for, for us to do is to, um, show some different bobber riggings because I think that bobber fishing is just a, a fantastic way to get people, uh, rolling and it's real cost effective. And, you know, whether you're using the old red and white bobber that, that you just clip on the line and float, or, um, yeah, you're using a slip bobber, um, I, yeah, between John and I, we got a ton of different bobber styles yeah. that we fish. <laughs> so, uh, especially for myself being a predominantly a float fisherman for steelhead, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, man, it, the balsa floats and the cork floats and all those types of things. There's, there's so many different types of floats out there and we can talk about all those in the different styles and who makes them and, and which ones work good, which ones don't work good, which ones are used for what application, because you can, you can still get away with, you know, using something that's not made for the application, but it's just not going to work the same. So, you know, yeah. and then, and then just like, you know, which, which ones do you really need? Cause I, I think we've tried damn near every bobber out there on, on planet earth, but you know, what, what do you really need and what don't you need? Uh, I'm t my, my favorite way to take someone that's never bass fished before. Um, first off, I ask my buddy if I go to his pond, right? And then if he's like, yeah, go ahead. You can take someone to the pond, you know, make sure they clean up after themselves because he's trusting mm -hmm. me. That That's that's part of not being a, a, a wasteful and rude person is picking up after yourself, especially on someone else's land. Mm -hmm. All right. So just I'll always keep that in mind. Anyway, what I like to do is I like to take them out there and then I nose rig a fluke on a one knot wacky rig finesse laser sharp hook that I've sharpened. I nose hook a fluke. We throw it out under a bobber and they just pop the bobber. They don't even reel in. They literally just pop the bobber because what's that doing? The flute's going yeah. like this. It's a dying bait fish. It's just, it's just yeah. moving around. It's twitching up. It's falling back down, and it gets slammed. And you can catch so many bass like that. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So don't don't get it twisted. Bobber fishing's great. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. Don't don't let somebody down you for being a bobber angler because um, you know uh, it, it's kind of funny the the invention of the the jig and float steelhead fishing came from a guy that was from texas that fished jigs and floats for bass and he was like huh i wonder if this will work for steelhead well 30 years later the rest is history you go into any tackle shop up here and there's hundreds of jigs on the wall and and all kinds of different float combinations and and they've made improvements to floats to make them accommodate that but who would have thought, you know, everybody's like steelhead, super technical, you know, uh, drift fishing and years and years and years of learning how to tick the bottom with the right amount of weight and present the, the bait in the correct areas and things like that. And, and here comes a guy, he's just like, oh, here, string it on a bobber, drop it down there eight feet. And then, um, you know, just let it kind of work its way across the bottom with a little bit of sauce on it, you know, for scent and bang, you know, here's a steelhead. If they're there, they're going to gobble it up such a basic way. And it really opened up steelhead fishing for a lot of people that were intimidated of the snags and the hanging up and, um, you know, just really, um, having to retie gear on a regular basis. So it did you, floats open up fishing for people. And, and, it, and there again, it improves success because it's so visual, you know, that, that, that it goes down, you set the hook and you have a fish typically, unless, uh, you know, you're hung up in some rocks or, you know, something else. So it does work absolutely excellent. It's a very good way to fish. So, you know, we already kind of touched on, you know, making the memories and just taking it all in. Um, that, that, that's one of our points we wanted to talk about is uh, you, so you have to, when you're making your memories, you, you got, you got to think about it like this. If you're planning a trip with your family and you want everybody to remember it, 
there, there's a couple of things that you might have to take into consideration. You're going to have to want them to catch fish more than you do. Uh, we'll get into trip management here a little bit later, but even if you don't catch fish, maybe you're just out on the water, just try to find something to really, because I know I remember every trip I've ever taken my son on, but I don't know if he can say the same about going with me, but yeah, just him being there is a pleasure for me, but try to find something that can really, you know, if there's turtles on a log, point them out and be like, Hey man, you know, what kind of turtles do you think those are? And then talk about turtles and just talk mm -hmm. about life and just enjoy your time together. It doesn't have to be about the fishing per se. Now, uh, there's a lot of folks that I know that there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You know, they're like, if I'm not catching fish, why am I out there? And there's not a thing wrong with that. I, I'm like that a lot to be honest. And then there's other days I'm like, man, I'm just really blessed to be out here in nature today, you know? So just be willing to take that, to just step back and really make those memories and enjoy your time with each other, you know? Yeah. I, and I think that, that that's a good point, John, is uh, you have to be ready to not fish. You're going to have to put down your rod it's just as simple as that. As much as you want to be out there like, hey, look at me. Well, we get plenty of our own time to go out and fish. Uh, sometimes it's, yeah, you know, sometimes the kids are like, oh, I don't want to go fish, blah, 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 blah. I, I stood there with my my 16-year-old daughter. She's she's fly fishing for bluegill. I, I quit fishing. I sat there with nothing more than my my set of pliers and my my little, hol the little holster on my hip and the fly bag and the bottle of, uh, you know, float. And uh, I was like, all right, cast back, cast forward, cast back. All right, lay it there and then just slowly retrieve it. And I, and, and, you know, showed her how to get the fish to hit. And I, I didn't have a rod in my hand at all. And then we sat there for two hours and three hours and she was catching fish. She's like, dude, this is so cool. You know, it's like, well, that's better. You know, I'd, I'd rather hear a 16 year old say like, Hey, that's super cool. You know, that I'm catching these little pan fish on a fly than saying, Hey, it's super cool. My buddies and I are going to be down there, you know, smoking crack behind the McDonald's, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I would rather. So if that means that I have to, um, set down my, my rod or not even get it out and just sit there and be the guide, that's what I do. When I take my niece and nephew out they're they're 11 and, and uh, they're the same age. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So, so they, they're 11 and, um, I throw them up in the front of the boat. I'm like, you guys sit here. And, and then I say, cast out and they cast out to both sides. I'm like, put the rods in the rod holder. And I just sit there and idle the engine. Okay. Some people aren't fortunate enough to have a boat. I'm very fortunate to have a boat and they sit there and they, and they and have like discussions about life as an 11 year old or whatever. I don't, I don't touch a rod. I'm, I'm sitting there driving around and I'm like, you guys are out of control. You know, why don't you guys get a, <laughs> you know, a bag of Oreos or something and start eating. And so they're, they're eating Oreos and they're bouncing up onto the bow and back and forth. And they're, they're in life jackets. So if they fall in, you know, I'll just be like, huh, huh, you know, they'll float off, you know, I'll go back and get them. But, you know, I never take them in an aggressive area. You know, it's usually a lake or something like that. So if they fall off and all that stuff, they got life jackets on. But anyways, uh, I'll see a rod go off. I'm like, hey, grab the rod. And then it's just like this mad scramble and there's stuff flying everywhere. You know, there's like, <laughs> here, here goes a, a soda across the deck, you know, and they're like, oh, and they grab this rod and they start feeling, well, I don't, I don't fish. I'm, I'm just out there running the boat so that they can fish. They don't, they don't even realize like, you know, well, you know, they're, they're fishing, but they're not, you know, and so it keeps it active. <laughs> then they're like, oh, we want to go faster in the boat. It's like the fish can't get the bait if I go faster in the boat, you know. But you, you have to stop fishing and you have to coach the kids. And when they hook a fish, you got to kill the engine and you got, you know, you got to be able to look out for other people and then tell the kids like, stand up, walk over here, point your rod over here, get it up here. We got to get it in the net. You can't go fish. You, you're going to have to put down your rod and you got to make sure that those kids are hooking fish. That's probably the most important thing. Make sure the kids are hooking fish. And, and to that matter, you know, that this will kind of segue into that trip management and everything else. Um, make sure you're going to a place that that's been stocked or, you know, that there's fish go do your pre-scouting. Don't just say, 
oh, well, we're going to go fish the, you know, this lake and not know that, you know, it hasn't been stocked in six months and it was fished out, you know, three months ago and there's nothing. It's like a biological dead zone. You know, you got to know. So that trip planning and management aspect, which we'll, we'll talk about here, that's, if you take a kid to a dead lake, they'll never want to go back out with you again. So you got to spend some time outside of just taking the family out and figure out like, okay, well, well where's going to be stocked, you know, or, or what's, what's hot, what's not, where am I going to find fish, you know, depending on what you're looking for. And that's, and that's a real important thing. It, it just, just the last thing I, I just, I'm going to say it again. You have to want them to catch fish more than you now take that how you want it but it, you can't go out there and fish and then expect someone that doesn't know what they're doing to just go catch fish. It, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, they can get lucky. People catch fish all the time that they don't mean to catch. I mean, one of the biggest bass, in fact, I think it was a state record for a long time, was caught on a chicken nugget. You think they actually thought they were going to hook the state record bass on a chicken nugget? Probably not. So, so people catch fish on accident all the time, but get to get that satisfaction for them going and to get that, okay, well, I'm solving the mystery of fishing this, this day, because tomorrow it's a completely different puzzle, mm -hmm. but today we're figuring it out and we're talking about it and you're catching fish and I just want you to catch fish. When I, when I take my, even if I go with my buddies, if yeah, we'll, we'll both be fishing, but if they hook something, I put my rod down because them catching that fish, because I've got my net, them landing that fish in my net is more important to me than me catching a fish over here. When that, that fish right there is, that's, what's more important to me. Mm -hmm. All right. I've, I've been fishing at the spillway before. I was, actually, I fish at the spillway all the time. Who am I kidding? And this guy hooked this absolute giant buffalo. I've got it on video, and I sent him that video. <laughs> and he had it on an ultralight rod. And I quit fishing, and I watched him wrestle in this, like, I'm not even kidding, like 25, 30-pound buffalo on this ultralight rod for like 20, 30 minutes. Just as soon as it got close enough, I scooped it up in my net and that's how we did it. You know, you, you've got to want them to catch the fish, be a person. All right. Just be a human being for a second and not a fisherman or angler. Just be a human being and just know that I need to help them because I can do this. I know how to fish. Maybe I don't catch anything, but I know how to do it. If they're new, give them that mentorship and give them that time because that's what's going to change that day. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, God, you know, we'll, we'll have so many more days in our life to catch more fish. That's, I, I think one of the, the biggest problems is, is that it gets competitive to, uh, to an extent. And it's not a competition at all. Uh, so, and I know I've said that before, it's not a competition that who can catch the biggest or greatest or best, I guess, unless you're a tournament angler or something, I, I don't know. It's, it's not a, um, it, it's not a competition. I think, I think, uh, when, when we start talking about like the kids and, and, you know, wanting them to catch the fish more than you want to catch fish yourself, you got to realize that you're trying to um, in a way, get yourself a future fishing buddy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you're, you're trying to really get those kids hooked into that fishing so that you have somebody there in the future. That's like, Hey, let's go out fishing. All right. Sounds good. You know, or, or down the road, let's say, you know, you get older and you can't, you know, get that boat out anymore, but maybe they got into fishing so much because you got them into it. And they're like, Hey, you want to go fish with me? I got my boat. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll take a free boat ride out there, you know, or, or, you know, here I'll pay for gas and ice and, you know, you, you do the driving and all that, <laughs> you know, what, however it works, but that's, that's, those are the things is that, you know, they'll, they'll never forget the fact that you weren't sitting there concerned with what you were going to catch. 
you were concerned with them having fun and catching and and keeping or releasing whatever you're doing with the fish you're more concerned with that than yourself it's being selfless when you're on the bank and yeah somebody hooks up on a big fish uh you know don't just keep fishing you know it, 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 reel up don't don't make that person lose the fish because you want to keep fishing you know that, that's more of a bank etiquette thing but um you know especially when you're fishing with your friends or family uh, reel up and make sure that you you got the net you got the you know wh however you're going to land it you're going to tail it uh, or you know flip it out onto the dock and grab it I, it's however however that works but be there to help out especially being the experienced angler if you're listening to this as the experienced angler if you're if you're inexperienced with it though you know the best thing to do is to get the lines out of the water while the fish runs all over the place and then you know get the fish up and and make sure that you get it in and you know out of the water and if you're going to keep it, you know, take care of the dispatching faster. If you're going to release it, you know, make sure that you get your picture and throw it back and, you know, or, or help that person get the picture. You know, if your kids are hooking fish, you know, be ready with your camera and, and get that picture and then get the thing unhooked or whatever, you know, that's, but you, you have to be willing to set your rod down and not be like actively aggressively fishing. If you want the other people, you got to be out there coaching and guiding. Uh, to make sure that they're doing everything right and make sure that their experience is enjoyable. If that means that you got to go and flop the grill open while they're fishing and uh, throw the hot dogs on the grill, do it, you know, or, or, you know, get the snacks out, you know, say, Hey, I'm heading back to the rig. I'm going to get the snacks out, whatever you, you have to be ready to make that sacrifice when you're going to take uh, new anglers out. And as time goes on, they'll become more experienced. And, but the, that time that you pay forward teaching and, and coaching, uh, and, and making the experience good is going to pay back in dividends down the road, especially when they go with you again and again and again, because <laughs> they're like, Hey, I can go with, you know, this guy and go catch a bunch of fish, you know, or mom or dad or whatever else I can, I can go get a bunch of fish and they'll help me out. And that's always going to make the experience a lot better. Absolutely. That incredibly well said. So trip management. This, this is one that we could probably do an entire episode on. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll try to condense it down. All right. Uh, trip management. Um, I didn't write anything down for this. Uh, in fact, we don't write anything down for anything. But, <laughs> shoot but, from the hip. <laughs> but if I had to start and make a list real quick of what trip management means, it means budget weather yeah definitely budget and weather are pretty much my two big factors for trip management um and that's for getting to the water okay if the if the weather is dangerous i won't fish if the weather is bad if i'm by myself i will fish dangerous and bad are two different things and inclement it can get you killed. Rainy can get you wet. Okay. There's a difference. Uh, budget. If it's going to cost me a whole bunch of money to go out there, then I need to make sure I'm going at the right time to set myself up for success. Um, once I figure those two out and I make it to the water and if I have someone with me, then the trip management truly begins because that goes in one of those things of, uh, Brian can attest to this. If you're in a drift boat, there's a lot of moving factors. It's not, hey, I'm going to set up my spot lock on my trolling motor and we're going to beat this riprap for a little bit. And then we're going to troll on down here for a little bit. There's a lot that goes on to managing uh, smaller watercraft or even uh, Brian's boat ain't small by any means, but I'm saying like his, his drift boat, there's a lot to managing that. Um, you you've got to you've got to safely manage the environment in that boat especially if you have a lot of kids um it, it could go back to one of those things where you might not be able to fish for a little bit because you got to make sure everything's set up right uh if you're going out on a boat make sure you got the plug in your boat make sure your batteries are charged make sure you got good fuel um you need everything safety wise first before you even worry about putting your rods in that boat if you don't have a fire extinguisher, life vests, um, 
one of those float pillows that you're supposed to have on, on your boats. If you don't have all that stuff, there ain't no, there's no reason to go out, mm-hmm. honestly. And if it's not, if you've got a fire extinguisher and it's been in your boat for six years and you ain't even turned it upright to make sure it's still got a charge, you probably need a new fire extinguisher. That's part of trip management. You got to make sure that you're safe on the water so you can have that good experience so everyone can get home. And that goes into one of those things to where uh, personal safety devices, personal protective equipment, life jackets, wading belts, all this kind of stuff. Um, it, it's crucial that if I weigh this much, this life jacket has to be able to accommodate that weight. Uh, the little neck life jackets that have the, they're orange, they go around your neck and they have one clip around your chest. That's not going to save everyone. Okay. That's, that's just not, that's not how it works. And just because it's a life vest, like I said before, it doesn't mean it's going to save everyone. And if you, and if you're hauling ass down the river, which I don't condone unless you're fishing for money. And if you're fishing for money, you've probably fished that place a lot before and you kind of know what you're doing, right? Don't, don't be driving crazy out on the water if you don't know what's out there, especially. And because you hit some submerged timber, oh, yeah. uh, you, you rip the lower unit off your engine and you throw your kid out of the boat. Well, if you're just wearing one of those, if your child's wearing one of those neck ones, this is kind of grim, but I want you to, I want you to picture this because safety is really important out on the water. Um, you hit the water going 40 miles per hour, your kid just gets thrown out. Uh, you just broke their neck. I mean, that's, that, that's the sad truth to it. I'm painting this grim picture, but it needs, it ne- you need to know this when you're planning your trip. It's not just, Hey, what kind of beer are we drinking today, boys? It's you, you need to be safe. If mm-hmm. you're not safe, you're not coming home. Okay. So, but when, when you, when you talk about managing the watercraft or managing the trip, you got to make sure everybody's got the stuff they need, uh, not just beyond safety stuff, you know, make sure if it's your buddy say like, Hey man, you should really bring some water. I've got sunscreen and bug spray, but you should really bring some water because if we're going to be out there and it's hot, dehydration's another one of those safety things. And I don't want you to be so caught up in the safety aspect that it keeps you away from fishing right um no but you need to know your risks and you can't be risk averse as well okay um you have to you just have to be really aware of that they are there but you can't live off of the what ifs that's what risk averse means it means what well what if my uh boat dies well that's why you have an or Mm -hmm. okay you you just have to be prepared okay um personal safety devices personal protective equipment uh long sleeve shirts are great okay and if it's if if you're like well it's just way too hot for that then please please wear sunscreen okay Mm -hmm. um brian told me about this because i actually i spoke to brian when i bought my first set of waiters he was actually on the phone with me and we were talking over all this um wedding belts man uh you fall and you float your hat in the river yeah it's funny but if you don't have a wedding belt and your waders fill up it gets infinitely more unfunny as you realize you weigh 40 pounds more and you're getting beat with all this water and you're disoriented it's a uh, your waders fill up with the, the wading belts are not only fashionable, all right, because you can get some pretty cool ones. They'll save your life, mm-hmm. especially for children. Um, children need a good wading belt and a good life vest if you're taking them wading with you. Yeah, yeah, I can I can talk a lot about that that because. Um, so one of the unfortunate things that that happens around here a lot is, um, you know, and and it's not wrong to do. A lot of people don't look at it as being high common sense, but it's not wrong to do. A lot of people wear waders in a boat, 
as they go down the river and, and especially with our fishing styles hunting styles it's not too uncommon you're you're waterproof from you know up here at your chest all the way down to your feet so and and it rains a ton here so you throw on your rain jacket and you have those i mean you were pretty well waterproof at that point you know you, your face might get wet you get a few things we're we're used to it so so we'll go out and we'll fish and pouring down rain because it just happens but one of the common things and it's happened to a lot of people here is that they'll be in a flat bottom boat and we'll have wind kick up and they'll be boating along and that boat pitches one way or another and it throws them out they're wearing the waders they don't have a life jacket on they sink straight to the bottom drop. Done. Uh, people uh, fishing really fast moving streams. When we fish for winter steelhead, spring chinook, uh, discharges can be in the three to 5,000 CFS range on some of the rivers. It's moving. There's a lot of water. Somebody trips and slips. It's, it's like turning the shower on and, and just fills up your waders. If you don't have a wading belt on, you're going to fill up all the way and the the turbulence of the water is just going to drag you down and you'll probably end up jamming your your leg underneath a log or a rock or something like that and and you're you're done if you have a wading belt your upper body gets wet you don't get as much you can get yourself forced back up get on the bank and then your next priority is getting dry because you're going to freeze to death because unlike where john's at where you know it, like this last winter it got cold uh, a, a few days but uh, we have that all the time here uh, the, the river temperature is 40 degrees. The air temperature can be 20. You're dead in minutes. Like you are dead in minutes. You ice up and die. You'll like literally just go to sleep on the bank and die. It's happened to a lot of people. So the, the, the more safety precautions you take, the better off you are. Now, getting kids to wear a life jacket, uh, this, is, this is something that we'll talk about. Whether you're on the dock, on the shore, or in the boat, if you want a kid to wear a life jacket, you need to wear a life jacket because otherwise they're like, well, you're not wearing a life jacket. Why do I want to wear this big, hot, ungodly thing? Well, what are you going to say? Well, yeah, because it's hot and big and I can't move around. They make all kinds of different PFDs now, a bunch of personal flotation device. And they have the ones that inflate with CO2 cartridges. They're very comfortable. They're small. Some of them, as soon as water contacts them, they go off. Those ones aren't ideal because you get splashed and, you know, it's just kind of like, boom, you know, uh, but they have ones with a yellow pull cord up here and you just yank and it discharges a CO2 cartridge and boom, it inflates and it doesn't leak. So you have that, that type of buoyancy. Um, John was talking about the throwable pads. That has to be a class four rated by the U.S. Coast Guard uh, flotation device. And that's not, it has the two handles. Well, those handles aren't there for you to like sling it over your back and be like, you know, turtle man. You can't do that. You, you, that that's like somebody flailing and they can wrap themselves up and then grab onto it and get up on top of it. That's, that's the, one of the most important things about those PFDs is that they're there for a reason. Yes, the fire extinguisher is very important. Um, the, the, the clothing, uh, when you're doing that trip planning, very, very important. Um, weather considerations, important budget considerations, extremely important too. So there's, there's just so many things that kind of tie up with all that stuff. You know, you have to look at all these things individually. We could talk about a lot of them, but th the most important thing is, is make sure you're safe. Number one, make sure everybody's safe, have a first aid kit, let people know where you're going, make sure you have all the legally required stuff that you need to have. And that's from, fishing licenses to personal flotation devices to fire extinguishing firefighting equipment signal devices all that stuff if you're on a boat if you're not on a boat and you're on the bank make sure that you have a way to like you know make a fire or you have a you know a charged phone with you you know if you have phone service Th those are those are just things that you should have when you're taking people out because you just never know what's going to happen if you're taking a multi-day trip make sure that your friends remember if they are on any prescription medications to make sure that they have enough of that prescription, especially if they're um, uh, life supporting medications. So we take like uh, inhalers for different types of breathing disorders. We take in uh, insulin. And if the insulin has to be refrigerated, you need to make sure that, that, that the person that's bringing it brings an individual cooler. Uh, I know it sounds like a lot of work, but they need to bring an individual cooler with its own ice and its own cooling stuff if you're going to be doing multiple days 
you need to make sure that that stuff is kept safe and separate and always traceable. You never want to lose that because if you're in the middle of, of nowhere, like we have, you know, wild and scenic rivers where it takes you three days. If, if a person that needs insulin twice a day goes without it one day, guess what? It, it, it's not good. Uh, you're going to be pulling, you know, a lot of those guys that use those spot GPS beacons, you're yanking that thing and the coast guard's coming and they got to fly that person out to the, the um, ER because they're, they're going to die. Uh, if they don't get that. So really important to make sure that that stuff's covered. Um, first aid kits, pick one. It's better than having nothing. It, it, we won't go over like, oh, well, you need this one and this one. Just get a first aid kit, throw it in your stuff. Make sure, I don't care if you got a couple band-aids and a wad of gauze. That's better than, you know, trying to, you know, rip your shirt off and wrap a rag around a, you know, a gushing wound, you know, at least you have something that's sterile, that's there, that's you, you can work with. So, you know, first aid kit, if you're going to be waiting, make sure you have the appropriate boots, make sure you have a waiting belt. And if the kids are going to be waiting, yes, make sure they are in a life jacket too. Uh, even if the, the belt fails somehow, like the, you don't get it tight enough or it loosens up as the kids walking, they slip and fall, their head is kept above water. That's the most important thing. Keep the head above water so that it can breathe and the life jacket's going to do that. If, you, if you're talking about the little orange life jackets, like what, what John is talking about, th those are great loners. They're great, um, you know, for the kids if they're just splashing around the bank and stuff. But honestly, it, a life jacket is a life jacket. It's meant to save your life. Spend a few more bucks and get yourself a vest style life jacket. I can't say enough about those. They're comfortable. Um, they, they work good. They're not going to come off. You're not going to end up lynched or hung. Uh, and they have far more buoyancy. I love them. I mean, I think that they're, they're the best way to go. And usually you can get a fairly good deal on them. So, but, uh, you know, we'll, maybe we'll do another episode on, on the whole trip planning and, uh, we will be talking about boats. So we're going to get a lot more in depth on, uh, watercraft and boats and laws and regulations. And so we can probably talk a little bit more about like everything you need, but make sure that you're covered, uh, A to Z on all that stuff and make sure you have everything together. And, you know, once you get it together once and i mean really get it together like this i know that my first aid kit is in this pocket of my backpack or i know this first aid kit is under the passenger uh, seat in the boat or do yourself a favor and know where your stuff is if you're an unorganized person this is the one time you need to really buckle down. And if, it, if your boat's got to be messy, know where all that mess is. You have to know where your stuff is at because there's, there's some times where you have moments to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, I keep a tourniquet with me. <laughs> yeah. No, literally, that's, that's it. Uh, you know, when I'm by myself, I don't keep band-aids and stuff like that. If I take my son out, I, I take a, I don't take my sling bag. I take my backpack and we've got water and we've got like extra socks, uh, tourniquet, first aid kit, like, uh, Gatorades, uh, wipes, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuff like that because you know, the dynamic changes, but when it trip planning by yourself is just as important as planning is if you're going to bring someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if it, but with taking other people, it's even more important because your, your safety is not just, you're not in charge, of just your safety. You're in charge of their safety and it, it, it has to be reciprocated. If, if you've got a buddy that's just really unsafe on the boat, man, just, just tell him, be like, Hey man, don't do that. You're going to get hurt. Yeah. And, and if you got someone that just won't cooperate with you, then just go back to the dock, man. Just load the boat up. It ain't, it ain't worth fighting on the water. And it sure as hell ain't worth dying on the water. Yeah. Just take, take the boat back. Yeah. And I think that, you know, man, uh, yeah, managing that trip and, and covering all that stuff. There's, there's a couple other things here. I'm, and I'm going to jump ahead on this one. Um, when 
people go out, they want to have a good time. Sometimes a good time to those people is getting trashed. You know, they, they, they want to go get uh, a couple racks of beer and they want to sit out there in the boat and get drunk. In my state, that's illegal. You can't drink on a um, uh, vessel at all. Even if you, you're not operating, you, you're, and I know people do, but you're not supposed to. Um, by going out on the waterway with a boating license, you're automatically consenting to um, uh, uh, sobriety exam uh, test uh, by, by law enforcement. Um, don't, don't allow things to get out of control out there because it just never pans out good. If, if you got a, 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 you know, a, a person that you've taken out and they get belligerent and you know they get belligerent and they're, um, you know, uh, they, they like to, you know, get drunk and that's not something you're into, um, maybe don't invite them if, unless you're able to say, hey, you know what, we're not going to bring booze on this trip. That might be the better thing to say. Say, we're not going to bring booze on this trip because you can't control yourself. Or you just say, hey, we can't have booze here. You know, it doesn't have to be a personal assault. That's all in your communication style. Um, if somebody doesn't want to roll with that, then they don't have to come. Um, but if, if you got people out there getting drunk, number one, it's, it's a major safety thing. Um, anybody under the influence out there is, you know, it's going to be a major safety thing. Now, um, you know, like as I was saying earlier, you know, my wife, what she likes to do is go out there and kayak and fish and all that stuff and take a model of fireball and all this other stuff. Right. Well, that's, that's like for the end of the trip and we have designated driver who's me and it doesn't happen out on the water. So it's, it's the things that you do in order to manage those types of things. It's like, you know, you want to make sure that you are managing uh, the people that you're in charge of taking care of. You want to make sure that all of that stuff's done. So, and, and to further that, you know, some places um, that, that, you know, marijuana is illegal or, or, or legal, I should say. Uh, and that's considered to be a control, you know, a substance that, you know, can intoxicate somebody, right? So, so if that's the case in, in the state you live in, like mine, um, that, that falls under the same laws and rules of DUI, everything else. You can't go out there and get stoned and start driving a boat around or anything else. But, um, you know, be responsible about it. Uh, if, if you got your, you and your buddies, uh, you guys want to go out and spend a weekend fishing. And when you get back to camp, crack the beers and give yourself a raging headache for the next day, go for it. You know, that's, that's usually the majority of the time with, the, with a lot of the folks that I fish with, that's what happens is that everybody goes out, everybody stays clean for the day, they don't do anything, and they come back at night, cook dinner, we crack beers, and we sit around the campfire, and nobody gets hurt, you know, unless somebody gets drunk enough to fall in the campfire, but uh, that hasn't happened in a lot of years to me, so, um, you know, but then, but, you know, nobody's in the water, nobody's in the area, you know, and usually, you know, everybody drinks, and they're just sitting there, at, next to the campfire by the time they're done with their last beer <laughs> falling asleep and uh, nobody nobody's getting hurt you know and and so uh but we also you know all of the, my friends and people i associate with they don't get out of control they don't get belligerent when they're dr drinking or anything else like that and everybody's like oh i think i'm gonna go to bed you know and they just go crawl into bed and, and next morning everybody's up trying to make coffee and they're like Ugh. you know that's it but nobody gets hurt and, and where we go, it's not banned. So that's the other thing is like, if you're going to go somewhere and all that, make sure you check the rules because there's parks and places where like no alcohol is allowed, which is, you know, fair enough because people have got hurt and killed and fights and things like that because of it. So they're like, hey, no alcohol here. Cool. Make sure it stays away. So trip planning, plan ahead, that kind of thing. So that's all a part of that too. So I, I just wanted to jump ahead to that point there. Uh, before we before we go into the next things, yeah, no, that's it's so important to. Uh, I've never drank on a boat, ever. Uh, I if I you can't save someone, if you need saving yourself, mm -hmm. you can't. I don't drink on boats. I never have, and I never will. Um, in fact, I, I don't, I don't drink at all, <laughs> to be honest, but, um, it just ain't worth it, man. It ain't worth it. You know, be smart. 
mm-hmm. you know, in a lot of states, especially like if you're on pontoon boats and stuff like that, uh, a lot of guys, they'll go out there and they'll have a few. If the state allows it, that's fine. But if you're driving that boat and if you, you got to think of like the two to one kind of ratio here, if if there's three people in the boat, too, you need to be sober. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And if there's two of you in the boat, both of you need to be sober. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's just just think about it like that, because yeah if you can swim that's good and if your buddy can swim that's good because that means two of you combined can probably save one of you can you know what i mean like and i don't mean like oh well your buddy's gotta die if you fall in the river that's all i'm saying i'm saying uh, you together can save each other you know what i mean and if there's one drunk guy that falls in and he's my size he's 250 pounds and now he's soaking wet with his cowboy boots on and he yeah. ain't really wearing a life jacket. And well, two of you can probably make sure that he's coming back up. All right. So keep that in mind. Just you, you got, you got to think like that sometimes and, you know, and we'll, we'll get off that, but boats have boats have CG limits and weight limits. All right. That's if, if you're new to the watercraft world, uh, the United States Coast Guard will have a sticker or a information plate on that boat by law. It's required. Mm-hmm. Okay. It'll let you know how much that boat can carry. Yeah. You could probably fit 10 people in a 16 foot John boat and it's going to float. But as soon as you turn it, it's going to sink. Okay. That's how it works. Boats have weight limits. Their cars have weight limits too. All right, folks. Just mm-hmm. throwing it out there. If, you, if you're rubbing your tires because you got so much stuff in your trunk, you probably ought to take some of that out. But anyway, um, it's, it's just another safety thing. All right. If you're a family of four and your boat says, I uh, cannot exceed four people, you're good. Uh, if you're a family of five or six, don't go out in that boat. All right. It's just not safe. Okay. Yeah. It's just really not safe. Do you do you and everyone else a favor and just don't go out in it? They uh, go go rent a boat a day or a half a day or a couple hours if you all want to go out and just go drive around for a little bit on the water. Go rent you a boat. They make big boats that you can rent for yeah. a decently affordable price if that's what you're into. All mm-hmm. right. So with all of this said, we, we talked so much about planning the trip, right? All to kind of, I guess, end with this is start small. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go plan for these three-day fishing trips. You can go plan for 30 minutes out at the local lake or pond. All right. Just, it goes back to a little bit of your trip planning, right? Well, life jacket, sunscreen, bug spray. And if if it's a, a a real shallow pond like two three feet and you know that for a fact because you've been in it before just know that you know your kid falls in just just reach in there and grab your kid out of there yeah. all right mm-hmm. all right it's, it's not as advanced as well we're going to be fishing in 109 foot of water uh, out here by the dam that has like a 9 million CFS, you know, it's just the water's just blistering coming out of the other side, mm-hmm. you know, that, that takes more planning. Okay. Um, start small, get your family out to where you all can enjoy it. Bring some lawn chairs, give your wife a little umbrella, let her sit out there play on Facebook and kick it sideways and play some candy crush and stuff while you and the kids are out there fishing. Just let everybody have an enjoyable experience and start small, man. If it's, you're going to go fish for 30 minutes and then go grill out under the pavilion, go do that. Yeah. Okay. So just start small, enjoy yourselves and be safe. And that's all, that's really all I got, man. Yeah. Uh, just uh, to, yeah, that's, that's right on the money, John. Uh, find, find your local park. <clears throat> you know, if, if, so if we're talking about you being, uh, you know, an avid angler, you're listening, watching, whatever, 
and, and you know where to go catch fish, just throw it out there. Like, Hey, you guys want to come down here for an hour tonight? Let's go, let's go down here, you know, 20 minute drive hour there. And then on the way back, stop by the, the, you know, little place where you can get ice cream for the kids and have ice cream, well, whatever, you know, it's, it's totally fine. Um, you just start with little things like that. And if the kids start catching fish and wife starts catching fish, you know, where she's just like, God, this is so relaxing to sit out here. So many people have forgot, like you, you set up a lawn chair in a park and you just kick back and, and watch the kids run around and play. And, you know, used to be you take a magazine or a crossword puzzle. Now you got a phone, right. You know, it, it, it's, it's what it is, but you sit out there and watch the kids and kind of do your thing. And maybe, maybe, yeah, your wife is like, you know, Oh, get me a fishing license and I'll cast out. And they just sit there and let, let the bait drown, you know, <laughs> not even watch it. And, and maybe, maybe by chance they have a bait, you know, a bite go off or something, or maybe they just start catching fish. They finally put the phone down. It's like, dang, I'm catching a lot of fish. That's, that's what you're going for. But at the same time, yeah, you, you set up the grill under the pavilion or covered area or out on the picnic table, whatever else. And, and, um, and just have a good time, but yeah, keep it small, you know? And, and then as time goes on, if you want to do a combo camping, fishing trip, you know, find a lake that got stocked, go to, go to a campground that's got good amenities. You know, you don't want to take them up into the, the back 40 wilderness where I like to hang out, uh, uh, to where, where, when you open up the, the, uh, the, the, the outhouse door, it's enough to knock a buzzard off a shit wagon. You know, you want to go <laughs> somewhere where, where it's clean, you know? And so you go to a nice maintained campground and uh, uh, take them there and make sure that you have all the com comfort amenities, you know, nice big air mattress and, uh, you know, good cooler full of food and beverages and uh, covered area, lots of bug spray, of course. And uh, if you're allowed to have campfires, uh, you know, plenty of firewood and s'mores materials and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, go, go take them out and you might get a half hour fishing out of the kids and, uh, maybe an hour and a half with you and your wife or whatever else. And then you're doing something else, you know, you're playing badminton or swimming or out playing in the boat. If you, if you have a boat or a rubber raft or whatever, you know, you're just doing all kinds of stuff, but it's, it's just another way to, to take your family out and have a good time. And it doesn't have to cost a fortune, you know, it doesn't, but you, you start small and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it's just like, Whoa, you know, this is crazy. Uh, you know, you, you might have, uh, you know, one of your kids when they're 17, say, I want to go to Alaska and go fish uh, sockeye salmon in the Kenai river. And, and you're like, really, you know, yeah, for my, you know, and, and that could be it where they could say, well, I want to go fish salmon and go hunt a caribou. Or um, they could say, Hey, why don't we go do a five day float on this river? It, it, it could totally be anything like that, but it always starts with the smallest thing. Oh, it's a half hour up at the lake or it's an hour at the river or a half hour at the river. And it just starts tiny and eventually it grows. So I think that's all we had on that, John. Yeah, I think so, man. Yeah. I, I know y'all, I know we talked a lot about safety, but it is just, it's really so important. It's, it's yeah. just really so important. And a lot of times we get in such a rush to go take these outings mm -hmm. and, you know, get back to nature or get back on the fish, you know, whatever reason you're out there, make sure you take your time and you're safe. All right. If you can't have anything else, put a Ziploc bag on your dang phone. Yeah. All right. If you literally, if you just literally can't have anything else, you've probably got a phone, put a Ziploc bag on that bad boy. So at least you can call someone if you get in a bad spot and it's going to work because it's not wet. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that's all we got today, folks. Um, Thanks again for listening. Make sure to check us out on Instagram over at Working Class Fishing, uh, YouTube, Working Class Fishing. And then if you have anything that you want us to do, you want to be on the show, you want to come talk to us and share your ideas and experience, make sure that you either uh, DM us through Instagram or send us an email through workingclassfish at gmail.com. But until next time, we hope to hear from you. Get out there and get on some fish. <laughs>